You might be a new dungeon master or a seasoned veteran, but you might be making one of these six mistakes that are actually rubbing your players off in the wrong way. They're probably not what you think they are. Number one, being too open-ended. If you've ever prompted your players with what would they like to do, and it's followed by crickets or blank stares, then there's a good chance your call to action is not clear enough for your players to respond to. Now, this has happened to me multiple times after describing the scene in elaborate detail, only to find my players not knowing exactly what to do. And I realized then that no matter how clear I was in the descriptions, if the options for my players weren't clear, some of them won't know what to do exactly. And I found this true for new players, especially those who have never stepped into a role-playing game experience before, they just don't know how to start. And so we can help keep our players engaged in a few ways. Number one, giving them specific options to act on. Number two, giving them clear objectives for the room so that they know what to do. Number three, give them a few tracks to follow. Railroading is obviously bad, but giving your players something specific to follow is not actually a bad thing especially if they're getting lost or wasting time or you're seeing them meandering around, getting nowhere closer to actually finishing or meeting the objective of a quest. My own players asked me to actually give them something specific because at some point it was too open-ended for them to figure out what they were gonna do next. So while railroading is a bad thing, laying down a few tracks is actually beneficial for your players. The second mistake that we could be doing is constantly asking for skill checks. I can't tell you the number of times I've made this mistake where I've been asking players multiple times to make a skill check and it was just completely unnecessary. This is especially true for persuasion and perception checks. Give a like to this video if that's happened to you. Persuasion and perception checks are some of the most common checks that are asked multiple times, but in reality can be any kind of check given any situation where you're asking more than once. And what I've learned over time is that really save the skill checks for when it matters, when something really challenges the player. If the player is not the type to engage in social interaction and they're going to ask an NPC several questions, that might necessitate a check. Now, if their strength is 18, and they're attuned to several items and they decide to punch a lock, chances are they're going to bust that thing open unless somehow it's magically sealed. You could spice things up by adding consequences to the rolls. So for example, a failed check doesn't just end with you didn't do the thing, but you end with an unintended consequence, something negative. For example, if you're picking a lock and they fail, the lock could jam. So that stops you from spamming skill checks and it gives them a signal that, hey, I've got to try something else. Another thing that you can do, especially in a critical success situation, for example, you can give them an unintended surprise instead. So instead of spamming for skill checks, think of creative ways where you can add consequences to make those checks matter. Number three, arguing about rules. The problem with arguing about rules is that it's typically the game master and another player who has a very strong opinion going at these rules and it leaves everyone else out of the picture, which is not what we're we're trying to do. Rather than getting entangled in a contentious debate, here's what I do. Make a decision you feel is right in the context of the moment. Run with the consequences. It's completely okay if you get it wrong. And assure your players in the next game, you will look into this ruling. What this does is that it doesn't bog down the gameplay from figuring out whether something should be done in a certain way because the interpretations of the rules say so, but it actually gives you the freedom to make the decision on the fly based on the given situation you're in and move on. Because the last thing you want to do is spend 30 minutes debating, unless that's your thing, but it is a waste of time. You as the game master ultimately have the final call. Make a decision, get it wrong, get it right, move on. It's going to be okay. The most important thing is err on the side of fun. Number four, red herrings. A red herring is ultimately a clue that leads players to a dead end. And I am not a fan of red herrings at all because it feels like a massive waste of time. It's a time consuming detour and it makes players feel like they've wasted their efforts. Now, if you intend to use a red herring, at least make it helpful for the players in some way, shape or form. Does it give them a clue that helps them go back to a certain location where they find the actual clue that leads them back to the direction where they're supposed to go or something like that? Make it count. Remember that as players are going on, they don't know what you know about the quest. And so when they go down a direction, they're going to think that this thing is going to lead them to advance their quest. When they come to a dead end and there's no way forward, it is going to be frustrating to no end. So if you are going to do a red herring, give them some clue that pushes them back onto the track of the main quest. Number five, ending poorly. I'd argue that ending a session well is one of the most challenging things of running a D&D game. Imagine watching a movie or a TV series only to have the ending half-baked or stopped abruptly, or it doesn't even give a sense of closure. It makes all the efforts leading up to those moments futile. And that's what happens when we end poorly. Ending with a well-played cliffhanger, even in one shots, can help ensure that you've hooked your players for your next game. I made a video talking about cliffhangers and even an ebook that helps go through my 
process as to how I create great cliffhangers, whether it's an exploration conversation or confrontation, and I've designed it in such a way that it's a quick read and you can run those ideas in your next game. Grab that absolutely free on my Patreon. Link in the description below. Now, the last thing we can do to utterly kill our players' engagement is make it about your story. Nothing leaves a more sour taste in our players' mouths than having their ideas, actions, and inputs completely dismissed for the sake of the story. As much as I love storytelling, we're not authors writing a book. We're game masters running a collaborative game. And that's a huge difference. Tabletop RPGs are collaborative by nature. As much as we want the grand narrative played out, the adventure isn't fully told until it's explored by both the players and the game masters at the table. And that's what makes this game so fun and unpredictable. The fact that we don't have the entire thing figured out and we have to work with our players in order to make it happen. And rather than fight that, we can leverage every moment our players throw at us to tell a great story. What about you? What are some habits that you thought were okay but actually rubbed your players off in the wrong way? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching as always. I hope you found this useful and I'll see you in the next one.